So we will get started um, with the first presentation by Ruby Mann uh, entitled, What Are We Way Waiting For? So Data Source Prioritization Among Novus Raiders in Competency Committee Decision Making. Hello everyone, my name is Ruby and I am a recent graduate who has completed their undergraduate thesis in the Sonandara Lab and today I will be sharing my thesis project. To begin, competence committees are groups of experienced educators that monitor the progress of medical trainees and decide when they should be promoted to the next level of training. How competence committees make decisions can significantly impact a trainee's progression through their residency program and eventually the care that they will provide to patients. Within a CC, multiple sources of assessment data may be used to make these decisions that may be numeric or narrative informed that are actually utilized to guide the decision making process regarding a trainee's performance and competence. Examples include entrustable professional activities, multi source feedback from patients and colleagues, and objective structured clinical exam scores. While existing literature discusses group decision making and how CCs function in practice, how these assessment data are actually prioritized by committee members to make decisions remains unclear. The purpose of this study was to investigate data source prioritization in competence committee decision making using a sample of novice raters. 32 simulated trainee portfolios were utilized in the study. Each portfolio included five data sources commonly encountered by CCs in natural settings. This includes numeric and narrative scores for EPAs, numeric and narrative MSF scores, and a numeric OSCE score. Within each portfolio, these five data sources were manipulated to create different combinations of strong and weak portfolios. Certain data sources were suggestive of strong performance, for example, high numeric scores and positive narrative comments, while others were suggestive of weak performance, for example, low numeric scores and negative narrative comments. 58 undergraduate students were presented with these 32 simulated trainee portfolios, both individually and within groups. For each portfolio, participants were asked to indicate whether or not they would promote the trainee in question to the next stage of training. In the first phase, participants completed the study on their own via Lyme survey. In the second phase, participants came into the lab and performed the exact same task, but in groups this time, i.e. in mock CCs of approximately five individuals. The purpose of having participants complete the study individually and then in groups was to determine how, if at all, participants' responses actually changed based on group influences. Of these 32 trainee portfolios, five were used to calculate the relative weight of each data source. The five selected portfolios differed in strength from the positive control in which all data sources were strong, but only one data source, for example, one of the five selected portfolios comprised all strong data sources except OSCE score, and this pattern continued to the remaining four cases. Essentially, the difference between the positive control in each of the five cases was just one weak data source. The promotion rate, i.e. the percentage of participants who promoted a given trainee for these five portfolios for both individuals and mock CCs was subtracted from the positive control in which all data sources were strong to create a different score. And this different score was used um, to find the relative weighting allocated to the particular data source that was being looked at. Since our dependent variable, i.e. promotion rate, was dichotomous, we used a two by two Fisher's exact test to make the comparisons with p-value corrections for multiple comparisons using the home bond ferroni method. Both individuals and mock CCs appear to prioritize numeric data over narrative comments, potentially reflecting perceived objectivity and ease of interpretation. An alternative possibility is that novice raters may have ignored narrative comments because they lack the context to interpret them. However, this is unlikely as qualitative data from the study indicates that participants discuss the narrative comments associated with each portfolio at length. Although it was found that numeric data were prioritized in promotion decisions over narrative comments, that does not necessarily mean that narrative comments should be perceived as having less importance within the decision-making process. In the current study, this may actually signal the need to train novice raters on how to best discern narrative comments and use them within the decision-making process. Although the findings of the study may have implications for understanding the decision-making processes of new competence committee members and member training, 
Further studies using a sample of clinicians is required to build upon these exploratory findings. Thank you so much for listening, and now I can answer any questions that you guys may have. Hi there, yeah, I can uh, read back. I think I saw a question from Siraj. Could you describe the undergraduate raters in more detail? Were they undergraduate MD students? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for your question. So our sample consists mostly of first year psychology students. Um, so majority of them were first years. There was one third year student and just a couple of second year students. So the majority of the cohort did consist of just um, first year psychology students. They were enrolled in a psychology course and this was used towards their credit in the course. You're Thank welcome. you. I'm back now. Um, so um, from Leslie Martin, uh, may I ask about the rationale in selecting uh, novice faders? So this is a pilot study. So it's just the preliminary results that we did use undergraduate students, but we're currently actually collecting data from competence committee members. And we continue, we are planning to continue to collect more data. So because it was my undergraduate thesis due to feasibility, it's very hard to kind of find competence committee members and in such large amounts, which is why we kind of started off our pilot study with undergraduate students. But like I said, we are collecting data from actual competence committees and hopefully we can see the generalizability and if these um, results actually um, are mimicked in actual competence committee members. Okay, thank you. Um, so Samantha is actually just going to share her screen. Um, and I think we have time for one um, other question, a quick question. So this is from Bront Johnston. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on why participants prioritize numeric data over the narrative data. That's actually a great question. So I never got a chance to go fully into it, but we actually had a qualitative section as well in which we observed the competence committees, WAMOC, CCs actually discussing narrative comments. And what we saw was that the reason why we believe that numeric scores were prioritized over narrative comments is because people perceive them to be more objective, especially in cases where we purposefully um, presented conflicting numeric and narrative scores. We saw that people leaned more towards numeric scores because they did believe that it holds more truth to them because they are objective, whereas narrative comments, maybe um, the evaluator had said a certain thing and it was a one-time instance, so they were perceived as being of lower quality, which is why uh, we believe that narrative comments may have been prioritized more just because of their pre perceived objectivity. However, it is found in literature that narrative comments are able to capture um, performance concerns that numeric scores are unable to capture. So it is important to consider narrative comments and to better train competence committee members to use narrative comments. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not important. It's just that's what we saw was prioritized maybe due to some um, misunderstanding and pers uh, misconceived pr um, notions regarding the narrative comments. But yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, the next presenter. So I welcome Amir uh, Hamad, and they will be presenting the lack of contract validity when assessing clinical clerks during their anesthesia rotations. Um, so hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Just checking my mic. Okay, very good. Um, so as the title says, we're gonna be talking about the construct, the lack of construct validity when assessing clinical clerks during the NC rotation. So really the question we're trying to answer here is whether or not the clinical evaluation component of every medical student's mandatory two week anesthesia rotation is actually a valid measure of overall their anesthesia performance, but also is it a good valid measure of general medical knowledge? And this has context in the broader discussion of medical education because there is a challenge to identify students who are struggling in the absence of obvious kind of documented factors of poor performance if there's no failures on exams or rotations or what have you. So we thought it would be extremely useful and actually a desirable assessment tool to have um, if we could identify students who are at risk of failing or who are struggling without actually having any kind of metrics. And the literature has supported that when we can um, identify these students and provide interventions, they have better outcomes on their Medical Council of Canada qualifying examination and later on in residency. We understand there are limitations. You know, failure to fail is a common phenomenon in medical literature. And anesthesia itself is a specialty rotation. So we question kind of, does it have any role in the context of generating 
a picture of overall medical knowledge. We think it does. Um, this rotation is unique in the fact that medical students are with staff physicians one-on-one -on -one for oftentimes six hours of the day, and you get exposure to a wide range of staff physicians. So the input we think on aggregate will give us some idea. So what are the objectives? Again, evaluate the validity of the assessment uh, during the anesthesia rotation. But secondly, we want to assess the trends of the daily clinical evaluations to see if we can tease out inherently, is this a good assessment tool overall? How we did this? Well, every medical student um, receives a daily evaluation on eight different domains on a one to 10 point Likert scale, where one is below expectations, 10 is exceptional, and we expect the average to be five. It's designated at means expectation. When we take a mean of the daily evaluations, every student has about eight. We were then able to conduct a discriminant function analysis to retroactively assess the predictability of this final eval. Can it actually give us some idea of which students will pass and fail? And so if we look at results, first I'd like to bring your attention to the graph. You can see it's final mean evaluation marks over the frequency. There's a few things I wanna point out. Firstly, the mean final mark was actually quite high. It was at 7.1, which would correspond to exceeds expectations, which is a little bit uh, questionable. Secondly, we had no scores below five, um, which is again questionable leads to uh, a question of the validity of this assessment tool and thirdly if you'll notice there's actually a black normal distribution curve superimposed on the numeric bar graph which just shows that there's a difference the, the kurtosis of our sample is much higher than the peak of the normal distribution which would imply that we actually are getting a bit of a ceiling effect meaning that again the assessment tool in and of itself isn't as valid as we want it to be Secondly, when you look at the table where we actually have the discriminant function analysis predictions, we can see that the fail prediction rate amongst the um, lowest performing students is quite good. It's at 88.8%, meaning that we can retroactively kind of say, yes, the bottom performing students are most likely to fail the MCCQE1. But beyond that, we have a lot of difficulty discerning, you know, which students are going to do badly or poorly. And so that really leads to question, are we using a valid assessment tool? I'd actually like to take you guys to the next steps before I go to the conclusions. There's a few things we can do and that the literature has supported. First of all, we can address failure to fail. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a widespread phenomenon in medical education. Some assessors are unaware of this issue, so actually engaging in assessor education might be beneficial. But secondly, the literature has also identified that there are a lot of barriers within the system in place that prevent assessors from grading fairly. Fa uh, fairly. There are administrative barriers, like a lot of work to do to actually provide a failing or um, unsatisfactory grade to a medical student. There's also fear of litigation or professional consequences for the assessor. And so an assessment into the department here to see what barriers exist and what things we can work on would be helpful. We can modify the grading schemes, which is supported a lot by the literature, um, particularly work by Baker out of um, Boston, who's demonstrated that in anesthesia residency, which is the next stage of training in anesthesia, when you actually tack their um, residents' clinical performance with demonstrated competencies or outcomes, you get a much better discrimination of grades overall, and at least to a more valid assessment tool. Work like this hasn't been done in the undergraduate realm, but we could assess it, or we could try it and see what happens. And we could also clarify rubrics and just encourage broader grading overall to kind of decrease the level of ceiling effect and hopefully get a wider range of scores, making the whole thing more valid. And finally, we can engage in more research, both um, kind of in our institution to see what the validity of other rotations assessment tools are. This is just one. So looking at, you know, whether internal medicine, whether family medicine, whether general surgery has more valid assessment tools could give us some idea of what they're doing right and what we could do to improve. And secondly, actually talking to other institutions. This is a work that's been called upon in the literature before to actually publish this kind of data. So we can see, you know, are, is U of T doing a good job or what are their outcomes in other schools across Canada and even the world to see where we stand. So very briefly in conclusion, the current daily evaluation system really fails in identifying students um, who are facing difficulty early on. Although we have some evidence that it might work retrospectively, it's not really the ideal scenario, especially in the context, and, and we should assess the validity of this tool in the context of having both a very high ceiling effect, and secondly, the fact that we're not getting very good data when we conduct these analyses. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this was excellent. Um, we do have a question uh, from McNally. Um, the question is, I uh, wondered if you think we should work on raters rather than tools. That's a really good question. So um, I kind of mentioned that very briefly in my next steps. Part of it would actually be to go to the raters and say, hey, this is the extent of the failure to fail phenomenon or what have you in our department. Could you look on expanding the grading scale? So that's one thing that can be done. There is evidence to support that actually 
you know, doing that does help. There's some kind of tangential evidence that might be, in, uh, that's kind of alluded to in multiple mini interview selections. That's one of the interviews, that's an interview to get into med school that McMaster uses and now other schools have been using also, that shows you actually get good predictability and good assessment because of the expanded um, rating skill that instructors are taught to use. So we think there could actually be something there just to go to raters and say, listen, you must absolutely expand the scores. This is how it's intended to be used. And hopefully that could actually lead to better results overall. Great, thank you. I actually have a question. Um, in the literature, it does indicate that um, from kind of across North America, there's really little variation in clerkship grades. So I'm wondering if this kind of phenomena um, speaks to maybe some of your findings and also maybe it's not a question of whether or not the assessment is valid. Maybe there's just no predictability towards predicting um, the MCC part one because predominantly that exam is really assessing medical expert that kind of takes a wide range of knowledge and not necessarily anything that you would learn maybe particularly in uh, anesthesia. Uh, just a thought. Right, so I'll answer the second part of that question first because I heard it more recently and hopefully that kind of addresses the broader thing and then um, if there's something outstanding, we'll address that afterwards. So on the question of, you know, is this a fair assessment of general overall medical knowledge? We agree that there are some limitations and I think what we found most interesting is the fact that you are one-on-one -on -one with an anesthesiologist for the course of a day, but you have multiple anesthesiologists you encounter. So hopefully there might be some inkling that, you know, there are some deficits in, in overall medical expertise or knowledge. We think that anesthesia is sufficiently broad. It covers actually, you need a fair degree of knowledge on a number of medical specialties to actually engage meaningfully with this. Um, and we also think that once again, there could be some hints um, whether a student is prepared or what their overall knowledge or the professional kind of behavior could give us some idea that there's some correlation with other realms of medical expertise. Granted, once again, this isn't definitive. This is just a hypothesis we're running with and um, to make this, to kind of carry this um, experiment. Into the first part, you know, because there's very little discrep discrepancy between all of clerkship ratings throughout multiple medical schools, it's hard to say at this point in time. There's a lot of confounding factors. Once again, I mentioned failure to fail because that's something I've just read about fairly recently and can have a little bit more knowledge. It, that is also fairly widespread and there isn't a lot of support to have raters grade fairly. And secondly, there's a lot more pressure at the level of residency rather than clerkship or undergraduate medicine to have a fairer, more um, transparent and more valid rating system just because the transition to independent practice is seen as a larger or more important thing than just passing through uh, clerkship or undergraduate medical education to move on to residency. So that could be something that exists there. Great, thank you. So I noticed there's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I'm hoping actually maybe after, because we do have to move on to the next presentation, um, everyone can kind of stick around and continue to have those conversations one-on-one -on -one or just in the chat more um, generally. Okay, so we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, we will welcome Danielle Brewer, uh, Deleuze. Um, so they will be presenting on characterizing student readiness uh, for interprofessional learning across training levels and degree of program specialization. Thanks, Cassandra. My name is Sarah Wachowski and I'll actually start our presentation off. So hopefully everyone can hear us and Danielle is with me also. We'll keep the videos on if we can, but uh, if it starts to lag, please let us know. So we just wanted to start the presentation by defining what we interpreted into professional education to be for the purposes of this project, which is looking at characterizing students' readiness for interprofessional learning across training levels and degree of program specialization. We identified that IPE or interprofessional education was an opportunity where multiple professions would learn from, with, or about each other in order to enhance their collaboration and quality of care. We know that there's a lack of baseline opinion data that talks about the, su the success of IPE preparing trainees for collaborative practice as being unknown. So what we were hoping to do with this project is look at the spectrum of IPE readiness and opinions across incoming Faculty of Health Sciences students. And there's a table in the middle of your screen, maroon and gray at the top of the third or the middle column, and that identifies who our learners were in the graduate and undergraduate context. And we hypothesize that readiness would vary across training levels and degree of program specialization. So to achieve this outcome, we asked all incoming FHS students to complete rankings of the readiness for interprofessional learning scale statements. 
80% of our cohort completed a traditional Likert scale ranking of these 19 statements, where higher scores on a scale of one to five indicated more, positive, um, more positivity towards and readiness for interprofessional learning. The responses on these statements were averaged to create the overall Ripple score, as well as the four subscales of teamwork and collaboration, negative and positive professional identity, and roles and responsibilities. The remainder of our cohort, so 20%, were offered a key methodology ranking of the statements. So if you look at figure one on the bottom left of your screen, you'll see that there is a Q table on the orange side of the diagram. What this allows students to do is assign single statements to each cell in the diagram, thereby indicating their degree of agreement from negative three to positive three, but also consider the statements relative to each other because each cell can only house a single statement. This data is then interpreted using a bi-person factor analysis, which essentially allows us to look for groups of individuals who rank statements in a similar way. This means that they're going to share similar values, opinions, and preferences when it comes to interprofessional learning. Overall, we found that the readiness for and positivity towards interprofessional learning varied as a result of both the level of student, of graduate or undergraduate, and the specificity of the program that they were in. Specifically, if you look at the Likert scale data, so the teal column in the middle of the screen, and figure two, you'll see that graduate students, the gray bars, exceeded undergraduates in terms of their average ripple scores, teamwork and collaboration, and positive professional identity rankings. Further, general students, the pale yellow bars, had lower scores in terms of roles and responsibilities. And this is something that we would expect as these students have not yet specialized and are not interacting in a healthcare context. These results were further corroborated by our key methodology results pictured in the orange column on the right of your screen. Specifically, this data allowed us to visualize three different groups of students identified as factors here. Essentially, what we saw as a result of their qualitative feedback they offered, as well as which statements they ranked most highly at that positive three area, that we had three groups that either valued teamwork as a, uh, as a major component of interprofessional education, valued interprofessional education as it could increase the patient care they could offer, or didn't value IPE and rather prioritize their own self-interest. What was really interesting in our data and something that we don't typically see in key methodology studies is that the types of students that contributed to these groups were actually different. So if you look at these pie charts, they're actually identifying the proportion of students from each of the programs contributing to each of those groups. So factor one was composed, or group one was composed primarily of undergraduates, who value teamwork in interprofessional education. Factor two, which was students who value IPE for patient care, was made up of graduate students, so the gray portion, whereas factor three was a minority across all three groups. Thanks, Danielle. So in conclusion, this research has shown us that currently we have three groups of IPE opinions related to program level and student learners who are enrolled in the Faculty of Health Sciences. And we're also seeing a trend where IPE learning is increasing as students move from undergraduate to graduate studies. Our next steps will be to follow these cohorts that completed the initial survey long term as they move through their Faculty of Health Sciences program to see if we identify any changes in readiness or perception of interprofessional learning as they've moved across their training levels and degree of program specialization. Thanks for participating with us today and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. So we'll open um, the questions up to the group. And maybe to get things going, um, in terms of you were speaking um, about the next stages, um, how do you think kind of distance learning may or may not kind of impact the next stages uh, of the study? So that absolutely will um, impact the study in some capacity because we may not have the opportunity to bring learners together on site as part of their um, training programs. However, we know many learners in the Faculty of Health Sciences will still 
have the opportunity to engage with one another when they go out to their clinical rotations or clinical placements. And so it may be that the um, interprofessional learning that happens happens in the clinical context versus in the more controlled environment. So that will be something that we definitely will have to consider as we look at following these cohorts longitudinally and they might provide us with some really exciting and important data to help us better shape what we offer in the academic setting and how we mix that with the um, clinical experiences that some learners receive. Great, thank you so much. So we do have a question from Sally um, Banks. So did you collect any data and where the participants came from in terms of previous education? I'm wondering if the institutional culture or different schools might influence the attitude towards IPE and practices. So we did collect some information on their previous IPE involvement. Um, so we didn't collect data on like, physical locations of where they came from or what their previous program was, if they were in a graduate level program. But we did specifically ask about whether or not they um, participated in previous interprofessional education opportunities or worked in interprofessional teams. Um, so that's where we kind of tried to capture that idea um, to see if that could be influencing the results. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and then a question from Sandra. Um, so can you please offer insights from prior research that show the benefits of learning together for IPE? So there's a, a lot of literature to suggest that those who engage in interprofessional learning opportunities, particularly at the training stage, develop um, better relationships with their colleagues and better, um, I guess, opportunity or see the value in working together to offer better patient care once they get into practice. So there's a lot of evidence in the literature to say that if you are developing these early on, you're creating these long-term um, relationships and skills that are going to benefit patients. Um, so that work has been done there. Sarah, did you want to add anything with that? Mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, it's interesting, Dr. Woods in her keynote address talked about integrating basic science knowledge and applying it into clinical settings. So I think there's an extraction for that also around the IPE objectives of working with others from different health professions to have the opportunity not only to learn the um, discrete components of what each of the competencies might look like for interprofessional education, but actually have the opportunity to apply and work with others in order to learn how that might translate into either um, a controlled clinical environment like the simulation lab or in actual clinical practice. So I think the um, opportunity to learn together um, with one another is that we also have the um, opportunity to work on the um, competencies that maybe are best refined when we integrate them in a clinical context with others um, coming from a, a varied background of our own. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, so I will invite our last presenter, uh, Sandro, um, and we'll probably not do great on your last name, but um, Montero. So the issue will be presenting on assessing competency in the blink of an eye. So insights from rapid visual diagnosis uh, of ECGs. Yeah, good job, Cassandra. Uh, you got my name right. Um, so I will recognize that a lot of the text on this poster is quite small. So I'm just gonna guide you through the order of the sections um, and reinterpret some of what's written there, um, hopefully within the five minutes. Uh, so in the introduction, you've got two statements, one about competency by design frameworks and one about the validity of measures of competence. Um, so for those of you not familiar with uh, some of the medical jargon necessarily, the competency by design framework is the brand, uh, the Canadian brand, if you will, of competency-based medical education. Um, globally, most healthcare uh, professions are moving towards competency-based education formats of some kind or another. Um, and really that um, sort of charges all of us to consider what measures are ideal for measuring competence uh, in ways that are not time-based. Um, so standard finding in the literature around the development of expertise is that the more time you spend in training, the better you are. So uh, I think most people would agree um, that the, the more experience, the more time you are within your profession, practicing your profession, um, the more likely you are to do uh, better at performance assessments. 
but competency-based education challenges to, challenges us to look for indicators that might measure experience independent of time, perhaps. Um, so we have a somewhat complicated design. I'll try my best to simplify it. The details certainly are there for you to continue reading. But the basic hypothesis we were exploring was that we could actually tap into a specific experience of medical professionals um, in terms of their accuracy for detecting abnormal or um, normal uh, uh, ECGs. Uh, so we used a visual diagnostic task uh, and we assumed that people with more experience, regardless of where they were, uh, you know, whether they were a resident or a staff or senior resident or junior uh, resident, um, that the more experience would lead to better performance. Um, the Going back to the idea that more time and training should lead to better performance, we've got sort of a summary of um, within our predictions that there might be a main effect of expertise. Um, critically, we manipulated how much time our participants could view the diagnostic images for. Um, so if um, any of you have taken a test, you're familiar with the experience, read the question and you either know the answer right away uh, or you have to sort of think about it. Um, and so it's not that staring at the question for a long amount of time um, helped you out there. Uh, as soon as you got the context and the gist of it, you knew the answer. So we we're really trying to tap into that aspect. And so we varied uh, short viewing times and longer viewing times, um, showing these diagnostic images to our participants um, for time frames that in experiment one, you'll see ranged from 175 milliseconds up to 1,000 milliseconds, so that's fractions of a second. And in experiment two, we actually one second out to 20 seconds um, in order to give our participants some time to actually enter a diagnosis as well. Um, and sorry, just some background noise. Um, so clear as I move into walking through the results. So if we just look at the bar graph on the top for experiment one, um, you'll see that the data are grouped for a resident versus staff. So we had participants at the residency training level and at the staff training level. These were emergency physicians. There were 12 residents and 17 staff in experiment one. And the color of the bar graphs indicates the viewing time that they were given for the images. Um, they saw about 100 images that were either normal or abnormal, and their task for experiment one was just to indicate, was it normal or abnormal? And so you can imagine that there's an image on the screen, it flashes for 175 milliseconds and it goes away, and then you've got to enter, um, you've got to auditorily respond, um, normal or abnormal, and you move on. Uh, it goes really quickly. Um, my participants had great fun. It was sort of much like a video game for them. Um, what the numbers on the right hand side of those graphs are showing you, um, the stats there are confirming um, probably what you're assessing by visually scanning those bar graphs as, as well, is that the residents and the staff performed equally well. So P equals 0.7 for expertise shows that there's really no effect of expertise the way that this study was designed. Um, there was, however, an effect of the stimulus duration time, and you'll see that as P equals 0.7. indicating that with more presentation time, people were able to detect normal versus abnormal with more accuracy. Moving on to experiment two, as I mentioned, we expanded the viewing times for uh, up, starting with one second to 20 seconds. Critically, we measured two things here, not just the ability to detect normal and abnormal, but we also asked our participants to enter a medical diagnosis in this case. So just to remind you again, these are ECGs that are being presented on the screen. Uh, our participants were all had prior knowledge and experience with diagnosing ECGs. Uh, and the task uh, in experiment two was first to indicate whether it was normal or abnormal. And then if they chose abnormal, they then were given an opportunity to enter a diagnosis. And you can see that with these expanded time windows, we were able to pull out an expertise effect. The staff uh, did reasonably well um, in terms of whether the time windows were one second or 20 seconds. It's fairly equivalent for them. Um, the residents seem to do a little bit better with the 10 and 20 second time windows. 
And then when it go, when we're looking at accuracy, which is the graph just below that, the one highlighted in green, um, you'll see that there is a gradient there for expertise as well as for stimulus duration. Um, so going back to where I started, which was an interest in identifying metrics of competence that don't necessarily tap into uh, time spent in training, um, this speeded diagnostic task has some promise as we are able to differentiate experience uh, potentially at the individual level. Um, you can imagine that there may be some staff um, that have less experience with ECGs, some residents that have more experience with ECGs. Uh, and so a task like this seems to be tapping directly into that experience. Um, and this might be uh, something that could be useful in the future. Thank you for your attention. Now, uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so now I'll invite questions um, from the audience. So I'm just looking here. Okay, so from um, Valerie, so excellent presentation. Do you know how much the benefits of the interprofessional education transferred to practice environment? Right. That was from, that I was believe, <laughs> three probably months. a okay. question for Sarah to answer. Or, or yes, to answer. so sorry, <laughs> well, um, I went too far. So this is from uh, Sam German. Uh, here's the format. Um, has the format been uh, attempted with other specific measures of competency? Not, do you hope to test this in any other circumstances to identify competency? I ask, as I see, this is a very promising assessment methodology um, for the intended task. Um, yes, so um, I think the basic answer to that question is, is no. We have, um, we have explored um, experimentally, uh, certainly, the uh, images of ECGs, and we've explored radiographs um, as well with some of these uh, limited time frames. We've also explored some of our own data looking at clinical reasoning um, with written cases. Um, look, the speeded aspect of the task wasn't necessarily the focus, but we are gathering quite a bit of evidence to show that under speeded conditions, um, the expertise um, effect does seem to emerge. So indicating that under speeded conditions, people with more knowledge, with more experience, uh, with more competence in the, in the task um, perform better. Um, than, than people that require perhaps more training. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So I had a general question actually, um, and looking at kind of simulation, the notion of um, learner spatial ability kind of comes to my mind. So I'm just wondering, um, did that ever come up in any of the research that you, in this particular study, um, can you kind of speak to that? Because um, typically learners that have more of a dynamic or have a larger spatial ability might be able to um, perform the task uh, more quickly. So I'm not um, sure if you have any. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. I guess it wouldn't apply for when I give the examples of some of the, the written cases that we had used. Um, I can tell you that within our research group, there was certainly surprise that we found an effect at all with ECGs. Um, there's, in, in terms of the way that diagnosis for ECGs is trained, there, there's quite an algorithmic approach, an analytic approach, there's a lot of information to take in. Um, and so there's potential to add um, additional individual differences in terms of measuring spatial ability, uh, in terms of picking up those differences over time. Um, so, you know, maybe going back to more novice learners to determine, you know, which group of students might be uh, acquiring competence more quickly. Um, I suppose at this point, we were trying to tap into already established experience. Um, we, didn't, we didn't look at measures uh, of those kinds of individual differences. It's, it's possible that it could play a role. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and we'll look at one more question. So from Sally, so are there any implications um, of these findings for training? Um, I think uh, for my part, there's certainly growing evidence for the role of experience. Um, so even for trainees, you know, the value of gathering uh, experience for themselves. 
um, really just being exposed to as many examples of different cases and different images and practicing and practicing and practicing. Um, you know, certainly it's not that um, the take home message from this study isn't that healthcare should be conducted within five to 20 seconds. Um, the, the goal was really to show that um, there, there can be some, some benefits for tapping into experience that can, um, and, and competence and diagnostic accuracy that's possible within very short time frames. Um, and so that these, um, these findings indicate the ability to measure that experience. So for trainees, trying to expand that direct experience that they, they can, as much as they can, gather images for themselves, seek out more and more examples. Um, certainly they could put themselves through a speeded test uh, to determine if their own accuracy improves over time. Um, faculty could be encouraged as well to uh, create some of these situations. It certainly can be a motivating way to improve one's own visual diagnostic um, ability. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have some time left. Um, this session is uh, will be running until 12.10. So I'm wondering, um, Yes, so I'm wondering if there are any pressing questions for any of the presenters. We do have some time, um, or if you would like to kind of take that offline, um, we just might as well make the best use of our time now. Um, so please identify the person um, that the question is targeted at, and we'll try to get through a few more questions for the, the rest of the presenters. And if not, then um, we can end a little bit early as well. Well, thank you so much for everyone. Um, your presentations were amazing and for the audience for participating. Um, and it was great to see everyone again. Thank you so much.